morning, everyone. Welcome to the Marx School, Baruch College, and this first 2019 issue of the Marx Issues Forum. We're delighted to see you here. My name is David Birdsell. I am the Dean of the Marx School of Public and International Affairs. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, and I am delighted to welcome a distinguished panel to address a really critical question, not only in higher education, but in philanthropy overall, and that is the ethical dangers of politically motivated philanthropy. And of course, we are going to be focusing uh, today on higher education. Just a couple of words of context before I introduce our panelists, whose full biographies you'll find uh, in this morning's program. Uh, philanthropy in higher education is a big deal. Uh, in 2017, which is the last year for which we have complete figures, uh, over $43 billion of private money were raised in support of higher education. Now, the large majority of that money goes to institutions that are already reasonably well healed. Over $10 billion of that went to just three institutions, uh, to Harvard, to Cornell, and to Stanford uh, in the course of that year. But a great many institutions participate. There are five publics represented in the top 20 list. Uh, and an increasing number of institutions predicate their ability to deliver courses, hire faculty, do things that we need to do for students on private philanthropy. That's not to say, however, that all private philanthropy is created equal, raised in exactly the same way, or has the same set of implications uh, for institutional integrity, and particularly, I know we'll hear it a lot today, the issue of academic freedom. So here to talk about that today uh, is a marvelous panel with a couple of people who have been at ground zero of one of the larger controversies in the higher education universe. Uh, James Finkelstein, to my far right, Emeritus Professor at the Schar School of Public Policy at George Mason University. Uh, Jim has, please. Uh, Jim has had a variety of roles in higher education at a number of institutions, including administrative roles at Schar uh, and at the, uh, at, at, there's a university just to the south of here around Washington Square. It's uh, NYU. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and he has been there, so welcome back to New York, Thank Jim. You. It's welcome to have you here. And, and, and I should note, just for the record, that Jim Jim began his uh, career as a public school teacher. Uh, so always important perspective to bring to the higher education uh, enterprise. Uh, to my immediate right is Judith Wildey. She is the chief operating officer of the Shar School. Uh, she has had as well a number of roles, ministerial and otherwise, in higher education. She is a member of the Shar faculty. She has been a member of the University of New Mexico faculty. And she has also worked uh, for the accreditor of the accreditors, the Council on Higher Education Accreditation. Uh, so whenever I, uh, any of us are responding to accreditation, say, those people have all the power. Not true. Chia has all the power, and Judith <laughs> has been there uh, right at the epicenter. Thank you. But don't hold it against me. We shan't. We shan't. Okay, Even you. though we're right up for our middle states decennial accreditation, <laughs> and we'll be asking for something under the table later. Uh, and finally, in the middle of uh, our two guests from Fairfax uh, is Michael Seltzer on the Marx School faculty. Michael has had a long and distinguished career in philanthropy and other arenas. He's been a program officer at the Ford Foundation. Uh, he was president of what is now Philanthropy New York, then the New York Regional Association of Grant Makers. He has extensive experience in Africa and in other nations. Uh, supporting AIDS services and research uh, and a number of other areas. He is with us as a distinguished lecturer uh, and he will provide some broader context on these important questions. So welcome to all of you. It's great to see you here Thank this you. morning. Thank you. Jim, I wanted to start with you. Uh, as we've noted, this is a very large endeavor in higher education, uh, but it sometimes runs off the rails with uh, what is widely perceived to be undue donor influence. Can you talk a little bit about the scope of the problem and about how that problem comes to pass? Well, let me give you a, a specific example. Uh, when I was the vice dean of the public policy school at George Mason, we had a faculty member who sadly passed away at a young age, and he held the Koch chair in international economics. He had happened to transfer from the economics department to our school when he passed away. Uh, of course, we said, well, we have a new endowed chair in the school that we're going to fill, but I wanted to see the donor agreement. This was in, 90, this was in the late 90s. And so I went to the development office, got a copy of the donor agreement, read through it, and there was a line in that donor agreement that said that the Koch Foundation would have a representative on the search committee. Uh, took me a little bit by surprise. Uh, Mason really didn't have a 
big history of philanthropy, not like Ohio State or NYU oh. that raised you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so any money was important there. I took the donor agreement to the senior faculty and asked them to review it. And the faculty were adamant. We either renegotiate that donor agreement or we give the chair back to the university and let this be someone else's problem, which is exactly what we did. So this, and this agreement went back to the early 90s at, uh, at Mason. Uh, contrary to the comp people, some people thinking this controversy just started at Mason. Uh, the Koch influence started back in the late 80s, early 90s. And that influence has been pervasive. Uh, in the recent lawsuit by Transparent GMU, which is a group of students who sued the university and the university's foundation to make the Koch agreements public, uh, the university said, we don't have any of these agreements. They all belong to our foundation. So they made that argument to the courts. The court said, we agree with you. The university was dismissed. Uh, arguments went forward. But lo and behold, before the judge issued his ruling, the university said, oh, we just found a bunch of these agreements. Uh, over $50 million worth of these agreements. Of course, now it's too late. I mean, the case has already been argued. And that led is, uh, to a whole bunch of stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post last year about these agreements and really brought this controversy to, you know, to a head. So those agreements, according to the president of the university, all of which were signed before, of course, he became president, uh, said, these, you know, these contain terms that are unacceptable. And that started a whole process this last year at Mason of uh, review of all donor agreements, a uh, new gift acceptance policy that's under review right now. We can talk about that a little bit later because I don't think it really solves the problem. But this particular group at Mason, the, the Koch Foundation, and there are other foundations that participate with them in funding primarily the law school and the economics department, uh, have had a lot of influence at, at the university over the years. And I think most people, when they think of George Mason, they think often of the economics department and the law school, uh, and the, uh, Mason as being a conservative uh, university. Judith can talk more about what it really is, because uh, she's still there. But that's sort of how, so this goes back a good ways. And the university is still struggling with it uh, today, whether or not donors, uh, in particular this group of donors, should have the kind of influence they do in not just the law school and the economics department, but across the university. Okay. Uh, Judith, let's go to you next. Uh, and thinking certainly of George Mason, but of other universities as well. Jim mentioned that there is a Coke gift. In 2019, uh, the name Coke sets off flashing neon signs. In 1998, probably not so much. Um, is it just a problem of a small number of donors, and does it tip toward one or the other end of the political spectrum? Or is this a more pervasive problem, in your view? I'd say it's probably more of a pervasive problem. Um, the, when you look uh, at the literature, which, which we did in, in preparing for this, um, Education Dive has listed just recently the nine trends in higher education for 2019. Uh, the first one um, ha just happens to be that capital com campaigns will be getting much more ambitious. And by that, they mean huge campaigns. Um, you know, we used to say $100 million. Wow, that's really ambitious. Not anymore. Uh, Harvard currently has uh, a $9.6 billion, that's with a B, campaign. Um, Michigan and the University of Washington both have $5 billion campaigns, um, down to $3 billion, only $3 billion for the University of Florida. So I think one of the other issues here is it's not just private universities, it's not just public universities, it's both of them. Um, during the last academic year, there were at least 32 gifts that we could identify in excess of $50 million. Some people have started actually referring to this as philanthrocapitalism, <laughs> as all one word, philanthrocapitalism. Uh, and what they say about this is that, yes, billionaires are willing to give away their fortunes, but they're not willing to give away their power. So that's, that's one of the issues. Um, 
This number two trend that Education Dive identified is that many of those gifts will come with strings. Um, Jim mentioned one. I'll mention a different university, um, University of Wisconsin, which accepted $100 million from the electronics maker uh, Foxconn to create an interdisciplinary research initiative. $100 million, fairly broadly based, it sounds really great. Except there are little, three little strings attached to this. One, it has to be 100 miles away from Madison, Wisconsin. 100 miles away from the university. Um, it just happens to be near the future home of a Foxconn plant. And number three, uh, the university has to match that in order to get the full amount. $100 million is not easy for a university to be able to match. And then you add the newest twitch to that is that there's some question about whether Foxconn is going to build that plant or not. So if they don't build the plant, what happens to the gift? So we get all kinds of entanglements here. So I have more to say, but I'll let you ask some other questions, the other panelists too. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> let, let me turn to uh, Michael Seltzer uh, for a moment. Michael, uh, we have a, a, a serious supply and demand problem here. Yes. Uh, charities need support. Uh, the people who are in the best position to give that support are people who have very deep pockets. Um, can you talk a little bit about, in historical context, this notion of donor influence on activities and bring that back, if you could, toward the question specific to higher education? Thank you, David. Uh, my first foundation job was in 1969, and for foundation watchers, that was the year of the Tax Reform Act. Before 69, of course, uh, not of course, but sadly, there was no required payout, and that was where we ended up with a 5% payout. Uh, as a native New Yorker that grew up in the heyday of the Broadway theater, uh, there was a performer, Peter Allen, that used to say, everything old is new again. And I think that puts a historical context on the discussion today. Uh, if we think of the wealth that accumulated in the late 1800s that led to today's modern foundations, and some still ancient foundations, I should say, uh, the, uh, that also is universities, of course, predate, in this country, predate foundations by 300 years. I love your Harvard story because the uh, invention, because after we shouldn't forget Harvard was started by a collection of books by John Harvard, and that, that's a small <laughs> comparison to where, where it is today. So the, what I, when I mean everything old is, old is new again, uh, John D. Rockefeller, when he created the Rockefeller Foundation, had this interesting idea. He says, I want to have our foundation chartered by the US Congress. And this is, it was the heyday of him giving out dimes on the streets of New York and wherever he was. And the US Congress, in the height of Tarbell time and, uh, and uh, the controversy around the robber baron, robber baron wealth, said, are you crazy? <laughs> Basically, and, said, and denied John D. Rockefeller a charter. He then had to go to, uh, go to Albany, and, and uh, it seems that the New York state officials were, uh, were less worried about the associations that John D. Rockefeller had and was started, chartered in New York State. So the notion of wealth, uh, whether it be individual wealth or corporate wealth, uh, has, be has been with us a long, long time. I think what's different now is that it's come to a, a point where there are more incidents of it. There's greater transparency, greater accountability, the internet, uh, and also the politicized environment. So I think what we see now, in, from my perspective, is a more confluence of these issues than we ever have had seen. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I wonder if you could give us a sense of how much of this, again, we're, we've got $43 billion on the table. It's an enormous sum of money. Uh, washing across over hundreds of institutions, if not thousands of institutions. So not all of that is concentrated in one place, although 10 billion of it is concentrated <laughs> in three. Um, what proportion of that funding, and I'm not going to hold you to right. a number because I think that's hard to do, but uh, how much risk is there in that enormous portfolio writ large? And how would you understand the nature of the problem in terms of a proportion of that very big tab? So 
I don't know, it was a number of years ago, the Chronicle of Higher Education did an analysis of conservative, uh, gifts from conservative sources to universities in the United States. And George Mason ranked third. Uh, but the first two universities that received more than George Mason were Harvard and the University of Chicago. Huge endowments. George Mason has essentially no endowment. I mean, it's like 50, 60 million dollars. I mean, it's nothing. Uh, so if you give a million dollars or two million dollars to Harvard or the University of Chicago, you're not likely to get much for your money. You give a couple million dollars to an institution that, like George Mason, you can get a lot for your money. So uh, in 2016, I think, or 2017, 16 or 17, Coke donations overall were about just under $80 million from the, from the Charles Koch Foundation, not all of which goes to higher education. Uh, but when you give the, it, large amounts of money to some of the institutions where they, that they've targeted, like uh, George Mason, Chapman uh, University, you can, you know, that's a strategic investment. I, I mean, I like you know, Judith's comment, billionaires are willing to give away their money, but not their power, not their influence. There's a lot of influence to be bought. When you do it at a place that's located in the nation's capital, or some would argue the, you know, a capital, one of the capitals of the world, uh, and you do it strategically, you can, you can accomplish a lot. Uh, I was saying uh, you know, to the provost uh, you know, and people at breakfast, George Mason has been the largest supplier of presidential appointees to this administration of any university in the country. And in fact, there are some people who say that more George Mason faculty have been appointed to this administration than typically are appointed from Harvard in a Democratic administration. That's a lot of influence. Uh, yeah, we can talk later. I have some specific numbers I can talk about, about the kinds of money we're talking about at George Mason, which are pretty fascinating that you really don't see in the press. Uh, but there's a, the about, uh, 30 percent, between 30 and 35 percent of the money donated to George Mason uh, comes from Koch and, and other groups. A lot of it isn't for the benefit of the university per se, it's for the benefit of something called the Mercatus Center, which is its own 501c3, its own independent uh, charitable organization that's affiliated with the university but not part of the university. Uh, but the university support is responsible the university's foundation provides 85% of the support for Mercatus. So there's some sort of, I hate to, I don't want to use the word, you know, I, I regret using the term money laundering, but there, there is some recycling of these monies among these organizations uh, that's difficult to understand unless you really, really drill down uh, deep into the numbers. Uh, getting to your point about the modesty of some of the investments, I rocked myself to sleep last night reading the now disclosed gift agreements. Um, <laughs> it will get you to sleep, trust me. Uh, but I had noticed that some of those chairs were being sold for as little as nine hundred thousand dollars over time. Uh, it was a uh, which is. I, I, the, our, our advancement team is with us today, uh, far below what we would accept for, uh, for, for an endowed chair. Um, and just, I, I, I was interested in that relationship, and we can come back to that. But let me ask this question. Um, is this primarily a, a question of conservative influence or of political influence that could arise from anywhere on the spectrum. Uh, if a Tom Steyer or if somebody else identified with strongly liberal causes, also with a billion dollars in the bank, uh, were to give, uh, to endow professorships, uh, fund research centers, whatever it is, would we have the same level of concern? Mike? Uh, in the 1990s when I was at the Ford Foundation, we used to have in my circles there, categorize their, a funder, are they a buyer or are they a builder? Uh, and the, uh, or are they both? And the distinction was that a buyer is using almost a grantee as a vendor uh, to provide a certain service, you know, could be reducing the incidence of teenage pregnancy or in today's uh, for jargon, reducing signs of inequity. Uh, a builder is one who, see, who wants a twofer grant, which is saying that we want to move the needle on that issue, but we also want to strengthen the organization. 
and it's a very it's a closer relationship to uh, that you know we would like to see. And I think both uh, this might be controversial in some sense, but I think both sides of the political spectrum, you would find examples of both. I personally uh, abhor the uh, those who are simply buyers. Because it's it's not it's a disservice to the organization because one year funding is not going to make a major difference and anybody seriously looking at the kinds of issues that we look at our in our society uh, no we're not going to move the needle that much in twelve months and we need also to, to you know keep the uh, keep the electricity going and so forth but general support funding is still I'm sad to say which is the uh, uh, mother's milk to most organizations is is has not the needle on that has not moved at all. Although we still have institutions like Ford Foundation that believe in it strongly. So, Judith, thinking not only of George Mason but of higher education more broadly, uh, there is a wide, widely held belief, whether accurate or inaccurate, that colleges and universities are bastions of unquestioning liberalism. Uh, and what I know many of these donors are after with their gifts, I'm arguing against type here, gang, but you know, trust me, this is something we need to talk about, uh, <laughs> I, that many of these donors would argue that what their gifts do is to make some small inroads to right the imbalance um, and offer students and offer the research community broadly a more balanced set of perspectives uh, across the political spectrum. How do you, as a chief operating officer, respond to that? Uh, again, not solely within the Mason context, but within sure. the kind of fiduciary obligations you exercise in your role. Well, one of the issues that I think arises here is the recognition that, that we've all had to come to, at least at public institutions, where in the past, the state legislature has provided the majority of the funds. That's no longer the case. Um, most universities, and I'm not, not speaking Mason in particular, but most public universities, you know, if they see a third of their funding coming from the legislature anymore, that's a huge amount. It's typically much less than that. So one of the issues is they need the money. Where do they get it? So in a way, it, it doesn't matter which side. They're just looking after money. I, I will say that there are places um, where a lot of these donations are hidden in some ways. Um, one of the donors to the Shar School itself specifically asked that we put the whole donation agreement on the website. He wanted everybody to see it. I think that's something to look for is, is the transparency issue. Right. Um, the more willing they are to be transparent, I would say the more potential to be a builder. Um, that's what they want. Um, actually, in, in looking at some of the literature, we're finding four kind of themes, four things that we need to look for in the gifts or to, to be aware of as we look at gifts. Um, one of them, as, as Jim kind of hinted at is the threat to academic freedom. Um, whether it's on the liberal side or the conservative side, is there some sort of threat to um, academic freedom? We've seen a lot of this, a um, lot of threats to academic freedom lately. Jim and I do a lot of research uh, looking at the use of search firms in the hiring of presidents. And more and more of those are becoming secret searches where nobody is allowed to say anything. And finally, at the end, there's sort of the, the rush of the trumpets, and uh, here is our new president. That can be seen as a threat to academic freedom as well. But these kinds of donations can add to that. Another is the threat to the reputation. As Jim said, mm -hmm. um, Mason is seen as a very conservative university now. There are some departments, some schools that are that way. But it does not mean that the entire university is. But if you start taking a certain type of money, be it conservative or liberal, you get branded one way, and that may cause you problems in getting other types of money. So there can be that issue. Um, another is risk of being dependent upon these gifts. To some extent, you are. But 
are you dependent on a particular gift? Uh, we've seen universities who have accepted monies where uh, they're required to hire so many president, I'm uh, sorry, so many faculty members. Well, what happens when that money gets out? It's no longer being gifted, but these faculty members are tenured, and the university still, for potentially many years, is going to have to fund them. That's another idea. And then the, the last one I've already mentioned is the lack of transparency. So those are four things I think you can look at for in, within any gift agreement. See where do they range on the schedule, the, the continuum, and whether you want to accept that or not, whether it's conservative or liberal. Michael? I, I want to pick up on Judith's excellent point about reputation. Uh, I believe probably a lot of you in the room are familiar, but not, may not be with the Pew Research Study that was released last year about the image of higher, the opinion, public opinion about higher education. Uh, and I should add, Pew Research is actually part of uh, a foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust. And the headline that uh, was, most Americans say higher ed is heading in the wrong direction. But partisans disagree on why. And what was particularly interesting was they break, broke it down by Democrats and Republicans. And they discovered that there was truer of, of about Republicans, but it was surprisingly high among Democrats as well. So the question that is a really pressing question on the terms of this discussion is how much are these issues affecting public opinion of higher ed in particular? And we don't know the answer to that, but we know if we were in the corporate sector, they would, you know, they would have a tremendous number of metrics indicating about how their, you know, how their brand is affected when some, when a scandal happens. And we know from that very same Pew study that the reason that so many Republicans are skeptical of higher education is that they believe that it's completely captive of liberal politics. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, and I want to pick up on the transparency point. So, one of the things that happened in response to the transparent. Uh, GMU lawsuit, this group of students, uh, was that the Koch Foundation has now said they're going to make their, they're going to be more transparent. They're going to uphold certain core academic values. So I actually, you know, it's easy to say things. So I actually went back and looked at their website uh, over the weekend. This is the Koch Foundation. This is the Koch Foundation yeah. website. So they, their commitment is to make all major multi-year agreements publicly available. So they have three years of those agreements up, 2016, 17, and 18. There are 14 agreements. That's it. Uh, the, and the numbers are, are really, uh, you know, really, you know, really pretty interesting. Uh, the, those gifts are worth a little over $77 million for the life of the gifts. And the gifts range from being paid out over two years to being paid out over 10 years. Uh, if you go back and look at the tax forms for the Koch Foundation and look at what they paid out uh, in the most recent year that's available, which is 2016, uh, on those gifts, they paid out $1.2 million. They paid out that entire year $78 million. So they're being transparent about 1.5% of their mm -hmm. gifts. <laughs> so I'm not certain, you know, you know, what is transparent about that. But when you examine those gift agreements, a couple of things come out that I found, you know, fascinating. Uh, anybody in here do philosophy of science? You know, I did early on in my academic career. Uh, there's language in these new gift agreements. And just let me read it to you. I mean, it, it's just a sentence. Consistent with the donor's principles of supporting open inquiry and diversity of ideas in higher education, the donor's grant is intended to promote a republic of science at the university where ideas can be exchanged freely and useful knowledge will benefit the well-being of individuals in society. Sounds like mom and apple pie, right? Mm -hmm. The key there is the phrase republic of science. Republic of science is the title of an article by a uh, he became a philosopher of science, originally trained as a physician, then as a got his PhD in chemistry, a guy named Michael Polanyi. Uh, and, and if you go back and if you read that piece from 1962, it has pretty heavy overtones of a very libertarian view of the value of scientific ideas in society. It's uh, 
very Darwinian. That the, it's all, the, the best ideas you know, will always win out, and you should not do anything to restrict those ideas. Uh, I don't know if, if your provost here uh, you know, ever read that little piece from 1960, probably so given his background. Uh, but I don't think there are many university presidents and probably none of the advancement staff here would recognize those code words. But those are in all Koch agreements. So in signing that agreement, you're signing on to their idea. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about these agreements, these are gifts, supposedly, but they're not. Uh, they really operate more like grants or even contracts because they all have termination clauses in them that say we're only going to give you your gift every year and we're only going to give you next year's gift if we like what you did last year and you have to submit that to us for our review. That's not philanthropy, at least not in the world that I know. Right. Uh, now, the Ford Foundation might revoke a grant because someone did something really horrible, but uh, there's an assumption that with a, a gift, with a gift especially, we're giving this to you without a lot of strings. So if you go back and read these agreements and you look at the termination language in it, it's as complex as what Judith and I see in presidential contracts today. It gives the donor an enormous amount of uh, influence over what's going on in the university. So, Judith, you began uh, giving us a sense of ways that we can be prudent about this that would allow us to continue to harvest revenue. And are we all agreed, by the way, that we need philanthropic revenue to run colleges and universities in the current environment? We've become, de I don't know, we've become dependent on it uh, in new ways than we, were, than we have been historically. Largely because of the erosion of support that Judith described, uh, yes. I, that's the excuse that's given. You know, I'd argue that there are, it's also the way that presidents keep score today, and it's how they advance their careers. So there's a, there are lots of entangling interests here about the nature of philanthropy and higher education. Well, I hadn't expected to go down this road, but let's just stay right here for a minute or two. Uh, so we know if you're on the public side that state support year over year is declining in all 50 of 50 states and a 40-year rolling average. Right. Uh, we know that federal support in block grant form that moves to states is declining year over year in a 40-year rolling average. Uh, we know that the number one source that we've turned to to plug that bleeding mm -hmm. gap uh, is not philanthropy, but is student tuition, right? And students are paying more and more. And one of the other reasons in the Pew report that Michael referred to, that people are uncertain that higher education poses a solid value proposition for America, is that students are paying a greater, greater portion of their own or their family's assets uh, to get to college. Um, so is it better under that environment? And let's just stipulate that we can't wave a wand and get our public officials to invest uh, more in education, and particularly on the public education side. If we're not going to philanthropy, do we just soak the students more? Or do we ask the questions that some ask, are we spending our money wisely, uh, as efficiently and effectively you know, as possible? Uh, our research, you know, our other research on university presidents, if you look at what's happened to the university presidency and the cost of administration in universities over the last 20 years, I mean, the curve is like that. Sure. You it's look not at the, a curve, it's a... Uh, right. You, you look <laughs> yeah, at faculty yeah. salaries, it's about like that. Right. Uh, there are a lot of areas where costs of universities have run out of control. Uh, so uh, so there's, a, there's a balance here. Uh, and if you're going to have philanthropy, philanthropy for what? A couple of examples. Uh, when I was at Ohio State planning the first capital campaign, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Alex Schoenbaum, Shoney's big boy. He had been a football player in his day at Ohio State. He wanted to donate a million dollars to Ohio State, which back in 1981, 82 was real money. Uh, but he wanted to donate it to the athletic department. You know, to build a practice facility for the football team. Everybody here knows football, big deal, Ohio State. Uh, we had a decision to make, right? Get a million dollar gift, big news, but it supports a group of, you know, a, a very small you know, group of people and has nothing to do with the academic mission you know, of the university. You know, we were fortunate, we came up with a solution. We said to Alex, you can donate that money, but you gotta raise a million dollars for scholarships for non-athletes. 
which he gladly did and were successful in doing that. Uh, I don't know how much that happens today, uh, but it's, a, it's philanthropy for what? All right. Of course, the apotheosis of that story is Phil Knight in Oregon, but uh, we, we, can, right. we can talk more well, about that. And I think another thing is, though, we're getting to the point where it's not just this type of philanthropy being found in higher education. It's moving down. Um, we found w at least one case, but one that, one that I noted, a $25 million gift from the CEO of the Blackstone Group to his high school which again sounds nice except that it was a 21 page gift agreement which right away in my mind when you see that long a gift agreement you know there are many strings attached within that he had in there um, that the high school would be named renamed after his family and that different parts of it would be named after a brother an old track coach and so on and so forth uh, the school district was willing to do all that and were so willing that they waited until one day before they were meeting to vote on it to announce any of this. A minor public outcry, just a minor one. Um, but to me, the interesting thing is out of that is that they ended up accepting the gift with compromises. I couldn't actually find what those specific compromises were, except that the school kept its name. Other than that, it's down into high school and, and we can name others, you know, I, I know of others where that has happened as well. But I think again we come back to the idea of transparency. And we did find a study, an actual empirical study with data where somebody looked at transparency, among other things, but went to GuideStar. GuideStar.org is a great way to find out about virtually every philanthropic organization uh, in, the, in the country, every 501c3. Um, they have a sort of a grading scale where they say, if you provide the basic information, you're, a, you're considered basic. If you provide a little more, they give bronze, silver, and gold. So they took that as how much, as a measure, a metri metric of how much did these organizations reveal about themselves and what they provided to GuideStar. And what they actually ended up doing was a very sophisticated multiple regression. Okay, my last degree's in stats, so I, I enjoyed reading this. Um, but a multiple regression analysis where they accounted for a lot of the variance. But the final outcome really is that the more transparent these organizations were, the more likely they were to get contributions that they could pass on. So that the transparency is not just for those of us who are receiving the final money but it's for those organizations that are giving it as well. And I think that's something to remember too. Although looking at it, when he put these organizations into 10 categories, the least likely to be transparency was the category of university. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael. I, I'm, I'm just thinking that there is no middle states accreditation for foundations. Uh, if, if we're talking about universities and foundations, I mean, foundations, uh, the interpretation of charitable in all, uh, you know, state and federal documents is so broad. You know, it would take a, an Olympic swimmer to get through it, you know, to see how, how much variation there is. Uh, foundations are very wary of regulation and because they're concerned about the politics of the time. If you wanted me to say, would I want to see a legislation passed during this administration uh, uh, focusing on foundations, I would say <laughs> absolutely not. But a, a, another major distinction is the, uh, the question of stakeholders. I mean, we think of the stakeholders in the process in universities, as a member of our faculty senate here, uh, you know, we have a, a, universities have an incredible number of internal and external stakeholders. Right. And so one of the issues I think is worth addressing is the process where we, internal processes that we use in universities to come to, come to some 
agreeable position yeah. uh, that is going to satisfy the most important stakeholders, which is hard to exclude any of them. Yeah. And that's one last thing before we go to the questions. I mean, this is sort of inside baseball, but most public universities don't accept gifts directly. They accept them through their, their associated foundations. Uh, and these are almost always separately incorporated 501c3s with their own uh, boards. And there's a real debate going on in the courts these days about whether or not those organizations are, can be su are subject to the open records freedom of information laws of particular states. So the current ruling in Virginia is that they're not, although it's on appeal. But the Supreme Court in Kentucky recently decided that they are subject to open records requests, that they are actually part of the universities. The recent IRS, IRS put out some guidance on uh, executive, excessive compensation for nonprofit executives a couple of weeks ago. And there's even language in there that suggests that they view these organizations as part of uh, the, the universities. But because the universities and the foundations generally take the position that they're not, there's a lot of monkey business that goes on there. Uh, that unless you've been inside it, both from a university administrator and a fundraiser, most people won't see. One example in the new gift acceptance policy of my former institution, which is just you know, about to be approved, there's a line in there that says uh, they have all these conditions of certain kinds of gifts that are subject to review by this new committee. Except that the person who determines whether or not a gift is going to be reviewed is the Vice President for Development and Alumni Relations. And there is no reporting on the decisions that she will make, either, you know, even post hoc. And no appeal. And there, you know, so if she decides that, you know, my gift to my old school that's going to require them, that clearly violates these standards, isn't, subject, isn't going to be subject to review because her bonus is dependent upon you know, meeting the fundraising targets for the year, you know, guess what? You know, we'll never know that. So there's, there's a lot of work, especially, I would argue, that faculty have to do uh, and the media has to do uh, to hold people like me, who were administrators all of my academic career, accountable because left to our own devices, I, no one's, no, nothing against the dean or the provost here, you know, we have all sorts of other pressures on us. Yes, that's right. There are absolutely no unseemly pressures at Baruch College. <laughs> um, so I want to get to uh, the very good stack of questions, by the way. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, one of our questioners wants to know about uh, the existence of uh, e either requirements or disallowances of uh, <coughs> gifts that presume a public policy norm such as affirmative action. Uh, does that make a gift off ground that all money spent uh, in hiring toward this gift uh, shall conform to principles of affirmative action or something of that sort? I think that, you know, I guess I'd put it another way. I mean, a gift that restricted, you know, that said that you had to hire a particular kind of individual you know, uh, intellectually, you know, on basis of gender, on basis of race. I mean, just in a public university, it'd just be like, I would assume, the scholarship debate, uh, that you, you can't have those restrictions. But I don't know that it's been tested. Yeah. There's a related example. Harvey Weinstein. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that term, <laughs> that name. Uh, there was a public university on the East Coast and a, public uni and a private university on the West Coast that will go nameless that had to deal with uh, the receipt of gifts uh, from Mr. Weinstein uh, after the news came out of, 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 of his sexual activities. Uh, and they both diverged in their response. Uh, the private university received $5 million from Mr. Weinstein uh, for a program named after his mother to support uh, women in the film industry. Uh, the, and it was uh, the, the public university in the East uh, received uh, a gift, much smaller gift, to support the women's programming. The public university accepted the gift or didn't return the gift, and the private university rejected. And uh, we could say uh, the argument, and by the way, the, public un uh, the private university got much more publicity, maybe in the size of the gift, God knows what it was. That, uh, the, uh, 
the public <laughs> university received very little notice in the media about it. it was it only appeared in the one of their state uh, news, uh, newspapers and the uh, and this is a very difficult, complicated issue because the public university said this is going for against everything he has stood for he has represented and it, so it really the two stories raise a fascinating question about you know decision making in this process and also who was involved in the decision making the public university as far as i could detect it was not it did not have stakeholders involved in the decisions such as the women's programs that would have been affected and so I, it's a, f a fascinating example of what's going on. But the, it's the hiring issue of, of faculty that has been the third rail, right? I mean, uh, and that's, you know, and Mason has had, Mason has had to deal with that uh, because some of these former gift agreements required the hiring of specific individuals. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we've said we won't do that again, but as Judah said, you know, we have a, a long-term liability now in terms of the financial obligation of the institution to continue to pay that those people. Right. Okay. Um, and we will skip right over the irony of Harvey Weinstein investing in women's careers, but we, we'll, 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 we'll get there later. Um, one of our questioners has a question about an issue that we have talked about here, which is that the idea of endowments in perpetuity is less and less a priority to donors. New donors increasingly want to see impact and results during their lives. Does this also compromise academic or institutional autonomy and freedom uh, by moving a short-term agenda as opposed to a long-term agenda? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I would say it, it's an equal problem, um, whether it's an endowment or what's referred to as current use money. Um, it depends on how the gift agreement is, is written. Um, and so it comes down again to the transparency issues, to you know, all the things we've talked about. But I don't see that the current use money is any, has any less potential to be a problem than the endowments do. It's interesting because there's been a change here in the last 10 to 20 years. I mean, it used to be at a university, if you, in order to uh, name a professorship, you had to endow it. Uh, that's no longer the case. I mean, many universities will accept you know, a couple million dollars up front as current use money to hire the individual initially, to hire someone initially, and then that's someone else's problem five years later. Uh, you know, the same would be you know, true for you know, other kinds of naming gifts you know, for, for buildings. Uh, but donors, you're right, uh, the questioner is right, donors today, I mean, Coke doesn't give endowment money. They give current use money. So when they named the law school, uh, you know, the Cokes and this anonymous donor at George Mason as the Scalia, Antonin Scalia uh, Law School, I think you all know what it was called before. It was called the Anton, Antonin Scalia Law School. It was but, the Antonin Scalia School of Law. Uh, just figure out what that acronym is and you'll, uh, you'll smile in a second. Uh, all that $30 million is current use money. You know, over five years. But interestingly, the family of uh, Scalia, the grandchildren, so the document's written so that the family retains the ability to take back the name of the law school uh, through the lifetime of the youngest grandchild who was 18 years old at the time of the gift. Uh, long time out there, right? Uh, and it's not clear whether all the grandchildren have to agree, you know, or there's a, you know, it, 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 who, who knows. So they got $30 million, but they retain, the, you know, they, oh, they still own the name. They're only loaning it to the university, but for a very, very, very long time. Uh, no one really talks about that in, the, in this particular gift, but that to me is one of the more egregious, you know, aspects of, uh, you know, of that <clears throat> gift. And of course, the flip side of that is what recently happened with Avery Fisher Hall right. when David Geffen trotted right. in with a 10 times larger gift. Right. Uh, and now we no longer have Avery Fisher Hall. We have right. David Geffen Hall. Yeah. Um, so they're Fa facing uh, David Koch Hall. And facing <laughs> David Koch Hall. That is exactly right. One member of the audience has posed a hypothetical. Uh, this individual wants to establish a $100 million endowment. By the way, we're going to hold you to this at the end of the program. <laughs> uh, and on one of two programs, a women's studies program to promote 
promote the education and advancement of women, or a men's studies program to promote or advance the education of men. Uh, it's not negotiable. Which one of these do you accept and why? I think this is a clear gender issue. I, uh, and uh, I find this fascinating, the historian of our field. Women tend not, past and today, women tend not to put their names on their foundations. Commonwealth is Anna Harkness. New World Foundation is a, one of the McCormick family. Even Abigail Disney today, her foundation is called the Daphne Foundation. It's not called the Abigail Disney. Now, there are exceptions like the Laurie M. Tisch. And I think the, uh, who we've been referring to all day are men. You know, who uh, have, and I won't, I'm not qualified enough to get into questions of the, of, uh, of the difference of the sexes on these issues, uh, but clearly uh, the men are the greater offenders of, of these issues and confronting them than, uh, than women donors have been. So I would uh, suggest the money be going for women's studies. So, I, I, so <laughs> there was a, a case you know, that I dealt with where a donor wanted to support you wanted the university to adopt a particular curriculum in a particular area. And, you know, my view is off limits. Uh, now, if a faculty member has an idea for a, you know, to, for a new major or a new curriculum and something and wants to go around and support it and it goes through the curriculum review process of, you know, in the school, yeah, you know, yeah. the, whatever the faculty councils are at the university, that's, a, that's different. But when donors start coming in, and you see this you know, more in elementary secondary education than you have seen it in higher education, where big money comes in and says, we're going to have a new curriculum in uh, STEM, that if you just do this, we're going to solve the STEM problem. I think that's, you know, you know, that's a problem, especially for higher education. I think that's an abridgment of academic freedom. And, and can, you, can you sharpen that, uh, and one, one of the questions from the audience is, you know, I still don't see a problem here. What's, a, what, what's the issue if somebody puts the thumb on the scale for hiring? Let's take it with this idea of developing a new academic area. And we certainly have, uh, at, at this very institution, for example, a, you know, area studies programs like Latin American right. studies, et cetera, uh, which those are good things to have. Uh, STEM studies programs yeah. might be good things to have. Uh, when would we recognize a, f a hard foul in that kind of uh, donor? Well, I mean, I, I think it's where, where the idea comes from, really. I mean, if it, so if a, uh, you know, if uh, you have a, a donor that, sa that has a passionate interest in uh, you know, developing let's say, a particular you know, program on uh, you know, substance abuse and you know, has the cure to the opioid you know, crisis and you know, wants to train, uh, start a new program at Baruch for public health professionals you know, to address the opioid crisis, but you got to do it their way. And they're going to prepare everything and they're going to give you $100 million to implement that program. Uh, they're going to have a say in who the faculty are. They're going to have a say in you know, who the students are. They're going to have a say in what's taught, you know, how things are evaluated, how people are certified. That, that seems to me to be the antithesis, antithetical to the core values of, a, of the university and its faculty. Uh, if they want to set up an institute, they want to set up their own organization to do that outside that. But you know, the core values of universities are what seems to me we need to protect from being eroded in, the, in these cases. And money can, you know, is you know, very tempting. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, this issue at Mason this last year, if you read the Times Higher Education Supplement from January, uh, there's an article about George Mason and there's a response from the president of George Mason uh, to the Coke, you know, money there. And the president's very clear. He's trying to figure out a, a balance on how to continue to accept this money uh, without getting the faculty, you know, so upset that they're going to start, you know, Bear, you know, march it on his office. Last question. Uh, one individual wants to know if the gold standard for donations should be anonymous, no strings. Uh, and so I'd like you to respond to that issue. But more broadly, wow. assuming that private philanthropy is not going away from higher education, public or private, any time in the foreseeable future, how should we best protect ourselves and the values of the university in soliciting this kind of revenue? And we begin wow. with you, Judith. Okay. I'd say that... You know, 
first off, the two, the two most important things that I would say to look at is um, the effect on academic freedom in any particular gift and also the idea of transparency. The one donor that I, I mentioned earlier who actually asked that his full agreement be put on the website, that's about as transparent as you can possibly get. Um, and it's there for everybody to see. Uh, I've, I've had people come to me um, with, related to the law school at George Mason saying, I don't know whether I want to go there because it, 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 you know, it's got an eight-foot statue of Antonin Scalia in the lobby. What do you think that says about it on top of where the, the monies have come from? And you know, that one was not very transparent. You know, I have copies of some of their, their uh, the gift agreement partly because we were negotiating one at the same time and I wanted to see what are the, the pros and cons of, of each one and how could, could I compare them. But I think there are, is a gold standard and I think for me those are the two top things to look for and try and measure. Thank you. Michael? Uh, I agree there's a gold standard. It was written by Maimonides in the 15th century <laughs> where he said anonymous giving was the, mo the highest form of giving. Uh, unfortunately, since then, it's kind of gone in decline. I mean, uh, and it's a, I think it's, uh, I don't know if we can tie it with the, uh, Maimonides is not being taught sufficiently. I see, <laughs> see one person who, know, who knows about his 10, ten steps. Uh, but I think uh, we do need to remember also that philanthropy has its origins in our great religions. Uh, and, and to think through what the, you know, the full message, not just the message you should tithe or you should give, but the, uh, the amount of these uh, 10 different types, levels of giving, and I invite you all to look it up if you haven't seen it, is, is a wonderful precept for today. Thank you. Uh, Jim, last I, word. I, 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 I agree uh, that anonymous giving is, you know, is, is important. Uh, but it's hard to be anonymous when you're giving a billion dollars to a university. Like it just happened you know, with uh, Michael Bloomberg and Johns Hopkins. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, there has to be transparency and accountability on behalf of the beneficiaries of, the, of those monies. Uh, because it is, there is just too much of an opportunity mm -hmm. You know, higher education is not immune from corruption and, and controversy. We see, we see it all the time. I mean, Judith and I get a call every week about some university president somewhere getting in trouble about something. Uh, and what does that mean in terms of whatever? So I, I, I think that uh, you know, we have to become more transparent. And I would say, uh, again, even though I spent most of my life as an administrator in universities, faculty have to be more engaged in these processes mm -hmm. and not leave it to those of us who sit in the administrative offices to determine you know, what counts as transparency, how these monies should be used, uh, what, should, what should be supported. Uh, if we don't, this is a real area uh, that's not well developed or well explored in shared governance in universities. I was the first elected faculty representative to our board of trustees, we call it board of visitors in Virginia, uh, the development committee of our board of visitors. There had never been one before five or six years ago. All the development stuff happened in executive committee behind closed doors. And you know what? When it came time to discuss the major gifts, the two of us who were the faculty representatives were asked to leave the room. Can I add a point to it? Yeah, yeah. Real quick. Uh, we do have a wonderful example who is no longer anonymous, but that was not due to his own doing of anonymous giving in today's world, and that's Charles Feeney, who uh, created his Atlantic philanthropies in Bermuda so he wouldn't have to go through the rigmarole he thought of registering in the US. And he did only was identified when he sold, he, his fortune was from uh, duty-free shops. He started the first one in the world. And he was only identified, uh, he had come out as a philanthropist. And one of his major recipients is interesting is Cornell, where he helped fund uh, the, uh, also the campus here on Roosevelt Island. Uh, so he, uh, he, a proud Irish American, but a very modest man who didn't, who, I don't know if he was exposed to Maimonides, but uh, so we do, we do have donors still among us that, uh, you know, are, have, for a variety of reasons, are remaining anonymous. 
Please join me in thanking our panelists for a wonderful conversation.